Dad, in your last talk, you uh, mentioned how that God is not in the business of seeing how many people he can keep out of heaven, but actually anxious to bring everybody that possibly can come in. And um, in the course of your talk, you said some things that made me want to give you a chance to just say a little bit more about um, what you think or believe about the idea that uh, there's universal salvation, that everyone is going to be saved um, because God is just so good, he wouldn't let anybody stay out of heaven. Could you respond to that? Uh, yes, the Bible does not teach universal salvation. And uh, I, was, I didn't intend to give that impression. My main point was that God is too fair to allow anyone's eternal destiny to be based upon someone else on whether they succeed or not in their witness. And that if someone doesn't uh, witness properly, uh, God will give that person um, another chance from another direction. Now, that was the main point. However, I believe that there are going to be a lot more people saved than we think. We're familiar with uh, Jesus' statement about broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go in there at. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. I think there's another interpretation when he says few there be that find it. It doesn't say straight and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. It says straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. Shall we say the more abundant life, the surrendered life, and that possibly there will be many people saved who have not understood the more abundant life yet. So I think that's one way to look at, uh, at that passage. <clears throat> There's another interesting passage in Revelation 7 where it says that concerning the people saved that there's a great multitude that no one can number. And uh, the Bible never uses that kind of language about the lost, a great multitude that no one can number. So there's another clue. And uh, personally, I believe that at Jesus' third coming at the end of the thousand years, that God's people are gonna be in the majority. Amen. In the majority. In the majority. Uh, after all, isn't the plan of salvation bigger than to uh, end up with God only having a handful in comparison or a minority? Uh, there's another reason why God waits. You know, why hasn't he come yet? Why does he wait? Uh, he waits because he has the hope that there can be one more person. Hmm. And he will continue to wait until the world comes to the point of self-destruction. That is the time when he uh, says it's, it's, it's gone on far enough. Revelation eleven eighteen makes that clear. That's when the people get to the place where they can destroy the earth. Then there's no point in God waiting any longer. But until that time, he will wait and wait, hoping that a few more will come and accept you're making me think as you talk like that about a book that you wrote called Hard to Be Lost. Um, there's four or five reasons in that book in which you sort of, sum, in, a sum, in a summary, you say these, these five reasons are, are uh, big ones as to why we're going to have a hard time if we choose to be lost. We're up against some pretty big odds. Would you share those odds, the things we're up against if we choose to be lost once more? Well, there were eight. Oh, my. <laughs> I better read it, read it again. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll bring these in later, but uh, the conclusion to these big mountains that God has raised up to keep us from sliding into uh, perdition the uh, conclusion is that uh, it is much harder to be lost than it is to be saved. And God has made that uh, on purpose. And Second Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, I'll look forward to hearing the eight sometime in the next, next few meetings. Uh, I want to hear them again. All right. And... Uh, You've given me some courage to talk about dealing with failure when we think about how God is 
anxious that nobody perish. I hope you don't fail. <laughs> That was real encouraging. <laughs> I want to begin by reading something written by a fellow by the name of Robert Rasmussen, who was writing tongue in cheek, as he wrote in a book entitled Imagine Meeting Him. Two paragraphs. The problem with the New Testament is that its writings fail to recognize the optional nature of Christ's lordship. This can be traced back to the fact that Jesus was similarly misinformed. Would that the New Testament writers could have understood what many generations of believers have since discovered, that it is quite possible, even popular, to receive the comfort of having a savior without having to go through the cumbersome process of living according to his commands. Many of us have become quite proficient at living this way. We debate this issue wondering why the New Testament doesn't seem to agree with itself and wishing its writers had cleared up this dilemma. Now he was writing tongue-in-cheek. A little bit of sarcasm there, but he was describing something that uh, if your eyes are open, you can't help but have noticed. I attended a Christian uh, concert one time that Dallas Home was uh, presenting, and Dallas was uh, and still is. In fact, he gave a concert here at the college just a year or so ago that I attended. But I remember it was a concert I attended in Loveland, Colorado. And uh, at that concert many years ago, Dallas said something I've never forgotten. He said, you know, this is a great time to be a Christian. It's a wonderful time to be a Christian in the world's history because he said, this time of Earth's history, we are in this position where we can have our cake and eat it too. He said, for example, there's probably a whole lot of you who are here tonight attending this concert where we are focusing on Jesus, who tomorrow night will be down at Mile High Stadium in Denver attending the Rolling Stones concert where they will be focusing on Satan. Isn't it wonderful, he said, that we can have it both ways and still call ourselves Christians? And once again, you see Dallas was speaking sarcastically. He said, I'll tell you something. I believe that when God says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he was meaning 100%. He wasn't talking about some kind of affair with the world. He said, you know, we seem to be living today as Christians as though, he said, let me ask you this, guys. He says, if you were engaged to be married and while you were on a trip, you found out your fiance was having an affair, when you came back, would you be anxious to marry that girl? He said, we seem to be operating under this idea that the bride of Christ, his church, is okay to have an affair with the world and that God's going to come back for a bride that's being unfaithful. He says, we better look at our Bibles once again because there's something more waiting for us. I just shared Matthew 5, 48 with you a moment ago. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is a sobering text. So it's discouraging, actually. It would have been bad enough if he had just simply said, be ye therefore perfect. But he didn't stop there. He said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's very perfect. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it doesn't get any easier. Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. That sounds like a big order, a very big order. It's intimidating. It's a mountain. And it's because there are numerous scriptures that have this same kind of thought. 
that we identify with Paul in Romans 7, who says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no. The evil I do not want to do is what I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? There's the dilemma. Be perfect, big time perfect, failure, personal failure. How do we get this together? How do we get past what Paul was describing in his own experience there in Romans 7? Well, before going any further, I just need to remind you that at its core, sin is really a broken relationship with God at its core. That's what sin is. We can't forget this definition. It makes all the difference in the world as we proceed on the subject of dealing with failure, victory, obedience, sanctification, overcoming, any of the words you apply. We need to remember at its core, sin is a broken relationship with God. Romans 14, 23 says as much when it says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Now that's an interesting definition. What that means is that anything, whether it's good or bad, is beside the point. Anything outside of a faith relationship with Christ is sin. Therefore, I can live a life that appears behaviorally to be completely above board, no mess ups that anybody can fault me for. But if I am living apart from Jesus day by day and have no time for fellowship with him, I'm not seeking to know him better and becoming better acquainted with him through his word and through prayer. If that's not happening in my life, then I'm living my good life in my own strength. I'm living life apart from Jesus. And since the real issue in sin is living life apart from Jesus, then I am living in sin even if I don't do anything that looks bad. That is a sobering thought. But we need to readjust our thinking because that's what sin is. For too long, we have thought that if we can just keep the rules, we're okay. And so we've worked hard at keeping the rules. Well, the second thing I want to remind you of before we unpack this further is that our bad deeds do not keep God from loving us. Our bad deeds do not keep God from loving us. I love the bumper sticker that says, Jesus accepts you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. You can come just the way you are, but he's not going to leave you that way. He's promised to do something, and that's what we're going to look at here as we continue. But your bad deeds don't keep God from loving you. He still loves you, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you just the way you are. You do not have to get your ducks in a row in order for him to love you more. In fact, I heard it said this way once, and I like it. There is nothing you can do that will make God love you more than he already does, and there is nothing you can do that will make him love you any less than he already does. His love for you is as consistent as the sunrise and the tides and you name any number of other things. Your performance has no bearing on his love for you. Man, you've got to remember that because that's one of the devil's biggest cards. He likes to show us our performance and discourage us from coming to Jesus just as we are. Third point I want to mention before we really unpack this is that God is interested in a relationship with you regardless of how you're doing. See, he just wants communion and friendship. He wants friends. God is looking for friends. And he's not concerning himself with your performance because he knows that if you and he can hang out together over time, you will become like him because you don't hang out with Jesus without becoming like him. It's the byproduct of fellowship with him. 
He knows that. So he says, come, just come. Don't worry about your performance. Just come. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Come to me. I'll never forget a fellow that I talked to once. He came into a prayer meeting where I was uh, conducting a prayer meeting, and he sat at the back. I'd never seen him before. After the meeting, he came to the front. He said, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I said, sure. He said, now? And I said, all right. He said, could we go into a side room? I said, okay. So we went into a side room. I said, do you want to tell me anything before I pray, or you just want me to pray? Because I don't need to know anything to pray. God knows whatever it is that you're wanting me to lift. I'll just lift you to him. And He said, well, let me just tell you this much. And then he told me that um, he didn't seem to be able to uh, remain faithful to his wife. He was married and he had two children. And he said, I just seem to hop from one woman to another. And he said, I go to church and my former friends meet me at the steps and they say to me, if you are serious, why do you, what are you even showing up here for? Why are you coming to church? If you were serious about God, you wouldn't be living the way you're living. Who are you trying to fool coming to church? Get your act together, buddy. And he started to cry. And he said to me, they must be right. I must not be sincere. I must not be serious because it seems like no matter how hard I try to avoid the problem that seems to beset me so easily, I just can't get victory over it. I must not be serious or sincere. Would you please pray that I could become sincere? And he's weeping as he says this to me. I said to him, my friend, I have some news for you. Your problem isn't that you're insincere. Your problem is that you have never understood that Christianity is about who you know and not about what you do. And who you know is going to change what you do. That's what you need to understand. He said, tell me more. And so for the next hour, I talked to him about becoming friends with Jesus and about learning to spend some time with him each morning and show out throughout the day. I talked to him about the very same kinds of things that Sid talked to us about a few moments ago. And he just listened and the tears flowed. He said, do you think there's hope for me? I said, there sure is hope for you. He goes, okay, so what do, you, what do I do? You know, I need, to go, I need to go back tonight. I'm gonna go back to where I'm living and I'm gonna tell the girl I'm living with she has to get out and I'm gonna start trying to read tomorrow morning in the Gospel of John. And I said, I didn't say anything about telling the girl to get out. And he looked at me. And he says, you're, you're kidding. He said, I told you I'm living with this girl. She's not my wife. I don't have to get her out of the house before I start reading the book of John. I said to him, my friend, you don't clean up your life to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus to get your life cleaned up. Your problem has been you have been trying to do all this stuff first in order to prove that you're serious so that God will give you whatever strength you need. You just need to start looking at Jesus in spite of the life and the shambles in your life. Just look. He says, you're telling me I can go back to this house where this girl is and start reading about Jesus tomorrow morning. I said, why don't you ask her if she'd like to read about him too? I said, you think Jesus is any less interested in her than he is in you? He said, wow, that's amazing. So he says, you're telling me it doesn't matter that I'm living with it? He said, let me, I'm not just sleeping in a different room in that house, pastor. Do you know what I'm saying? I said, I know what you're saying. And he says, and you're telling me that it doesn't matter that I'm just living with this girl. I can seek God. I said, I didn't tell you it doesn't matter. Don't misunderstand. I didn't say it didn't matter. I said, you're not going to fix it by trying to fix that. You're going to fix it by getting to know Jesus. That's how you're going to fix it because Jesus will fix it for you. So I said, I'm telling you, go home, get out your Bible, ask her if she wants to read with you. He started crying. Then he looked at me through his tears. He said, are you really a Seventh-day Adventist pastor? (laughs) My friends, I have to tell you something. This is the most wonderful thing. He went back and he told that girl, he said, I want to get to know Jesus. He said, I have tried all my life to be a good person. Now I'm going to try all all my rest of my life to become better acquainted with Christ. And he said, I'd like to know if you'd like to help, you know, like to do that with me. She said, no, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. And she left without him asking her to leave. (laughs) 
He got out his Bible and he began reading. In less than two weeks, he was so excited about Jesus, he couldn't keep quiet. He ran back to his wife. He told her the good news. And here's the amazing thing. Even though she had not been having any affairs, even though she'd been faithfully going to church, she didn't know that it was about who you know either. She had stayed out of trouble, but she didn't know Jesus. She's just as lost as he is. He shares the good news with her, and she gets excited about it. And between them, they brought 300 people to Jesus in less than five years by sharing the good news. And I got to perform the wedding as they got remarried. And my wife was the maid of honor. It was an awesome experience. Two years ago, I was back in that town, and I called him just to find out. I, had a, I was a little nervous. I didn't want to find out that he had let it go. I said... How are you doing? He said, praise Jesus. We are never better. We're better in Christ with each new day. We haven't let go of him and he hasn't let go of us. But often our failures discourage us from seeking Jesus. In fact, I would suggest that the two biggest reasons that people who have entered into an experience with Jesus and then end up letting it go, the two biggest reasons... Now, these are people who actually have begun having a meaningful walk with Christ. I'm not talking about just going to church, nominal Christians. I'm talking about people who are spending time with Christ. Two biggest reasons. Dad already talked about one of them earlier when he talked about the failure to share Jesus with somebody else. You've got to share. If you're not exercising, your muscles just fade away. Spiritually, we must share. Here's the other reason that people leave. They get discouraged with what appears to them to be a lack of growth. The failures in their life cause them to become so discouraged that they just begin letting go of Jesus. They just feel they can't face him. They're so discouraged and depressed with their performance. Even if they know the performance isn't, isn't something that Jesus is condemning them for, they still feel ashamed and hesitant to come to him. So how are we to deal with our failures? Well, before we can know how to fight, we have to know who the enemy is. Do these texts give you any clue? Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's not against flesh and blood. This is supernatural. James 4, 7 says, resist the who? The devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's going to be more on that tomorrow night. Um, and I'm not just saying this. Tomorrow night, dad's preaching. Not tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> the, the days are blending together for me. <laughs> Tomorrow, Dad's preaching one of my favorite sermons. And in that sermon, the devil's favorite text, he's going to be uh, doing something with James, with James here that uh, you won't want to miss. But anyway, the point is, who's the enemy? The enemy is supernatural. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is the devil. Can you see the enemy? Maybe you can see evidence of him at work, but can you see the enemy? No. A few years ago, I was on a Sabbath afternoon. I was uh, spending time with a friend and his wife and their kids who were at our house and spent the afternoon with us. The sun was just setting. It was um, the 31st of October. This friend of mine happened to be the world heavyweight kickboxer. He held the title and took it in Tokyo. Um, Japan on uh, satellite television and I'd had the privilege of introducing him to Jesus and now he was excited about his friendship with Jesus and here he was in my home and we were talking and I got a phone call October 31st and on the other end of the phone was the voice of a woman who was demon possessed and the devil had chosen October 31st as a holiday to celebrate by tormenting her in a particular way. So on the phone, this woman begins to ask if we would come, if I would come and pray for her. 
And then all of a sudden, over the phone, a voice came that wasn't the woman, but was speaking through her. And the voice was so haunting that it just sent chills down my spine. My hair went bristling like a porcupine, the back of my neck. And uh, the voice on the other end said, in this very deep guttural voice that sounded much like a wolf would sound if it could snarl and speak English at the same time. And the voice said, don't come. She belongs to me. She's mine. You can't have her. Don't pray for her. She belongs to me. Stay away. And then the phone hung up. Oh, man. I had all this adrenaline just pumping through me. I thought, I sure picked the right vocation, didn't I? You're a preacher. You get to go meet the devil. I looked over at Steve world heavyweight kickboxer and I got this idea I said hey Steve how would you like to go meet the devil <laughs> I won't tell you exactly what he said but I'm going to paraphrase it he said oh I would love to kick his rear <laughs> sort of something like that he said <clears throat> I said just a minute Steve I can tell you right now that you and I aren't going to kick his rear if anybody kicks his rear, it's going to be bigger powers than ours. He says, well, I still want to go. Let's go, preach, he said to me. He called me preach. I said, well, get your sword. And he goes, huh? And I picked up my Bible. Oh, right on, Rev, he said. <laughs> and he got his Bible. We went to the home. I'm not going to tell you all of the details of the story except to say that there came a point where we were seated. Steve was in a barrel chair. I was on the couch, and the woman was down on the other end of the couch. We had the lights on. And uh, all of a sudden, um, she began to manifest. The demonic power was coming through her. And it was, it was scary, I'll tell you that. But it wasn't scary when you realize that Jesus was bigger than the devil and he beat him a long time ago. We prayed, we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we watched the enemy leave with his tail between his legs. Now we didn't see him literally, but we heard the sound as he rushed away. He threw her to the floor and he left, snarling. After it was over, I got in the car with Steve. We're driving away. The woman has been freed by the power of Christ. It's an exciting thing to see Jesus go head to head with the devil and watch the devil leave. That's an exciting thing. And uh, I got in the car with Steve, and he said something to me I never forgot. He said, you know what? <clears throat> he says, well, I was sitting in that barrel chair. When she started to go weird, he said, she looked at me and I felt as though someone else's eyes were looking through hers at me. And I felt like they were looking right through me. And then he said, all of a sudden, I felt what was like a heavy hand slam against my chest and press me into the chair. He said, it knocked all the wind out of me. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I couldn't exhale. I couldn't inhale. He said, I was so scared that I looked down to see if I had wet my pants. And then he said, I heard a voice in my head. I wouldn't tell you I heard it in the room, but this is what it said. So you're going to kick my rear, are you? And he said, that's when I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Here's my point. If the enemy is the devil, how are you and I going to fight a spirit? We can't even see him. And if we could, we'd be no match for him. The only way we can beat a spirit is to get a bigger spirit to fight for us. Amen. If we're going to deal with our failures, we're going to have to have a bigger spirit fighting for us. Because our failures are all about an enemy trying to have his way with us. That's what they're about. But some of us try to fight anyway. We say, we'll try harder, like Sid talked about. I'll just try harder. I'll grit my teeth. I'll clench my fists. I'll resolve. I'll think more positively. I'll possibility thinking that's what I've got to do. There must be something I can do. And for people who are strong-willed and seem to have a lot of backbone, they can make it appear that they're making progress. But it's only on a behavioral level that they're making progress. 
The weak people who don't have the backbone and the grit, they give up discouraged and they leave rather than add hypocrisy to failure. And that's why there are millions of former church members, millions of former church members in North America. Why? Because they tried to keep the rules in their own strength, failed so many times that they decided it was just easier to leave than to continue to face their discouragements and their failures. And so they left. Here's the good news. If they just get to know Jesus, they don't have to stay away. How much can you do? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is the most deceitful thing there is, and desperately wicked. No one can really know how bad it is. And let me remind you, where does God look? On the heart. Bible tells us that the heart is desperately wicked. We can't fix it, and that's where God looks. So we're in deep trouble. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness or righteous deeds are like filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. All of us, even our good deeds, are filthy rags. Even the ones who look like they're staying out of trouble, the good livers, filthy rags. Filthy rags apart from... Jesus. One more, Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change the, the color of his skin or the leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. The writer of the book Steps to Christ says it this way. All of your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. All. Not some of them. All of them. All of your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. But don't we have a part to play? Doesn't God help those who help themselves? Haven't we heard that somewhere? God helps those who help themselves. Aren't we supposed to be doing something? We do have a part to play, but we need to look very carefully at what that part is. There's an interesting story. In fact, there's a book entitled The, Soldier, no, the Unknown Soldier, I think is the title of the book. It's about a, an airman who was shot down during World War II. The Allies decided to try something. They took this man's body and they sewed into the lining of his clothes secret plans that were just mildly coded, which were false. But they hoped the enemy would find the plans on this man's body. And so they left the body in a little raft, loose, floating on the water near where the enemy was. Their wish was that the enemy would find the, bo the body, discover the code, the plans, and, and determine that they were going to go attack a certain city. And they wanted the enemy to mobilize around that city to protect it, thinking that if they could get the enemy to mobilize there, then they could walk in unresisted elsewhere. And that's exactly what happened. In the book, The Unknown Soldier, it describes it as a turning point for the Allied army and the war. What happened? The enemy went to fight the battle at the, long, at the wrong location. And when you fight the battle at the wrong location, you will lose the war. So we need to find out what the right location is if we're going to fight this battle and if we don't want to lose the war. So what is the right fight and how do you do it? 1 Timothy 6.12 says we are to fight the good fight of what? Faith. Isn't that interesting? It didn't say fight the good fight of overcoming sins, did it? It didn't say fight the good fight of trying to get your behavior in line, did it? It didn't say fight the good fight of obeying all the rules, checking them twice. It said fight the good fight of faith. There's only one good fight, and it's the fight of faith. Well, what's faith? Faith is synonymous with what word? Trust. Trust is something that only happens between individuals when someone is trustworthy and the other person gets to know them well enough to trust them, right? Is God trustworthy? Well, maybe he is and maybe he isn't. You're not going to find that out unless you get to know him, right? Do you think the enemy wants you to get to know him? 
No. Do you think the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from getting to know Jesus? Yes. You think he's going to make it as hard as possible to keep you in bed longer on the mornings that you determined you were going to get up for quiet time with Christ? You bet you the pillow's going to feel warm, the bed's going to feel warm, soft. This is just not the morning. I'm too tired. I'm not getting up. God's just going to have to accept the will for the deed. It's a fight. It's a fight to come into his presence and get to know him. It's the fight of faith. Faith is trust. You don't trust someone you don't know. So what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be fighting to get to know Jesus better day by day so that as we come to know him, he begins to do his good work in us and through us. That's how it works. <clears throat> According to John 15, 5, how much can you do apart from Jesus? Read it with me there on the screen. Apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. I put a little blackboard on the screen for you. We'll go back one more to the slide once more. I want to show you the blackboard. <clears throat> on that blackboard, I have Y equal, Y standing for you, minus X, X stands for Christ, equals how much? Zero. All right, how much is a zero? Zero is nothing. And how much is nothing? It's how much you have left once you take the peeling off of the zero. You have nothing left. How much can you and I do? Nothing. That's what John 15, 5 says. But how much can you do um, with Jesus? Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now the equation looks like this. Y, U plus Christ, X equals infinity. A little sideways eight. I can do all things. All right, now get this. If with Christ, I can do all things, but without him, I can do nothing, then who is responsible for whatever it is that's getting done? What is the difference between those two equations? The presence of Christ. You catch that? That is crucial to understand. See, if when something gets done, the only difference is his presence, then who is it that's doing it? Huh? Is it me? No. It has to be him. See, without him, nothing. With him, everything. So it must be him that does it. So what's my job? What's my job? My job is to get with him. So he can do what needs to be done in my life for me and through me. That's my job. That's the fight of faith. That's the fight of faith. It's the only thing left for me to do. Do you see how once again the relationship factor comes back into play? Once again it comes down to, as Sid said, he said, if I was just going to tell somebody one thing, I'd tell them one thing is needful, sitting at the feet of Jesus day by day, and he'll take care of you. He'll just carry you all the way through. That's why Satan wants nothing more than to keep you away from Jesus. He doesn't care whether you are naughty or nice. Did you know that? Satan doesn't care if you're naughty or nice. We used to think that it was Satan that just wanted to get us to do bad things. Satan is perfectly happy to have you do good things apart from Jesus. Because the people who seem to keep their lives out of trouble but don't have a relationship for Jesus are some of the most, in some of the most dangerous position anybody could ever be in. Because they think they have a false security. They think they're okay with God. They forget that living life apart from Jesus is what sin really is. And so the devil be more than happy for you to be good, be a good liver. He'd be more than happy for you to think that Christianity is about behavior instead of relationship. He'd be more than happy for you to work as hard as you can on keeping the rules instead of on getting to know the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't care whether you're naughty or nice. He just cares that you don't have any time for Jesus. That's all he cares about, just one thing. And all hell will conspire to keep you from communing and connecting with Jesus day by day. Because they know in hell that when you get that together, you've got it made. Why? Because you have bigger power fighting for you, living in you, transforming you. Satan knows, 2 Corinthians 3.18, that we with an unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image by the Spirit of the Lord. 
He knows, if I look at Jesus, I will become like Jesus, and his spirit is the one that will make me that way. He knows that. So he doesn't want me looking at Jesus. That's why we call this series more about Jesus. We just want more of him, more and more of Jesus. That's the solution to the enemy's attacks. Beholding, we become changed. And it works both ways, you know. If I want to become like Jesus, where do I focus? On Jesus, right? But, you know, for far too long, we have focused on our bad deeds because we've been trying to get rid of them. Oh, we say, I want to become like Christ. I want to have a Christ-like character. And so we begin working hard to get to become, have pure thoughts and to overcome our tempers and to become more patient. We begin focusing on all of our errors and all of our problems. We say we're focusing on them because we want to be more like Christ. But where is our focus? It's on the very things we're trying to get rid of, which leads us to a very interesting dilemma. If beholding we become change is a biblical principle, and if I am beholding my failures, I'm going to become more like my failures. It's a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. Behaviorism is a vicious circle. You don't get out of it because the very thing you're trying to get rid of is the thing you become more like because it's what's got your attention, even though it's all for the sake of Christ. That's right. The devil just doesn't want you to look straight on at Jesus. So he brings your failures up in front of you, tries to get you distracted. Chase the rabbits, chase the rabbits. Don't look at Jesus. In John 15, Jesus is almost ready to say goodbye. He's giving his farewell speech beside a grapevine. I want to read just two verses to refresh your memory. Abide in me, he says, as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Does Jesus command us to bear fruit or does he command us to abide? Abide. I want to hear you say that once more, just so you can hear yourself say it again. Does Jesus command us to bear more fruit or to abide? abide? Abide. That's the command. And in fact, 11 times in seven verses, Jesus says it. Abide, abide, abide. If you abide in me and I abide in you, then you will bear much fruit. It's the fruit of abiding. Does a grapevine bear grapes in order to prove it's a grapevine? No. It bears grapes as a natural result of drawing in the nutrients of the water, the soil, the sun, clinging to the vine. It's a product of a connection. And a life like Christ is a product of a connection. So do you see what your part is and what his part is? If we remain connected to Jesus, who is the vine, what does he promise to do? Isaiah 59, 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood... The Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. Amen. Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Christ Jesus. Did he ask you to be a fruit inspector? Did he ask you to take your spiritual temperature day after day, try and check out how good you're doing? Listen, if he's the one who said, I'm responsible for the fruit in your life, and you start judging whether or not you're making sufficient progress, who are you passing judgment on? Him. Think about that the next time you get discouraged and say, this is just not working. You're passing judgment on him. What that does is that sets you above God. That's what Lucifer got kicked out of heaven for, wanting to be above God. And when I pass judgment on God's progress in my life by analyzing my behavior and trying to determine if I'm growing fast enough, I am taking the very same thing that Lucifer took. He started it. He'll finish it. It's not your problem. You just keep in touch with him. Is Jesus enough? Amen. Is Jesus enough? Do we really believe that? I was in a little church in Colorado. And one day, two people came in after church had already started. A couple walked in through the back door. As soon as they walked through the door, you could smell the smoke reeking from them. They must have just, you know, been smoking before they came through the door. And they came walking right down. They came down almost the front row of our church, and they sat down. And if you had seen that couple, your eyebrows would have gone, whoo. 
I was talking about the privilege and opportunity of having a friendship with Jesus and how that He changes us. I shook hands after the meeting. They came out and they shook my hand. They were both crying, tears just streaming down their face. They said, would you come to our house and teach us how we can get to know Jesus? Amen. Well, what would you say to that, man? I said, all right. I started going out on Thursday nights to their farmhouse. They were chain smokers. I probably smoked about a pack and a half every time I went down there for a Bible study <laughs> just by sitting at the table with them. But the most amazing thing happened over the period of about three months. The most amazing thing happened. Without describing it in detail, let me just say that over time, over about three, four months, they began to look different. The clothes they wore, the way they made themselves up, the things that they seemed to care about and not care about just started changing. I never talked to them one iota about lifestyle issues or anything of that sort. I just tried to help them get hooked up with Jesus. That's all. Just that. We looked in the Gospels. We went through John together. And... Uh, Finally, one day, I couldn't, I couldn't bear it anymore. They weren't smoking one night. And I sat there, and I looked at, at, the, at the girl, and I said, I got to ask you a question. At our church, you know, have some well-meaning members of our church been hitting you up about how you have to change things and act differently and drop this off and quit doing that and give up this if you're going to be part of our church congregation? Have people been talking to you like that? She said, no. Why do you ask a question like that? I said, well, don't worry. I just had that question. <laughs> she goes, no, why did you ask that question? I said, well, you look a whole lot different now than you did three or four months ago. And I wonder if people have been telling you you should change the way you look. And I said, secondly, you're not smoking. And when I first came out here to study with you guys, you smoked so much that I just, you know. And she looked at her husband and she says to him, honey, When's the last time you smoked? He said, I don't even remember. <laughs> he said to her, when's the last time you had a cigarette? She said, I don't know. And they looked back at me and they said this. I tell you, this is the truth with my hand on the Bible. They said to me, they said, you know what? We don't even remember ever stopping smoking. We just don't have a desire for it or all that other stuff anymore. It's just disappeared. Amen. Is Jesus enough? You betcha. All we are asked to do is to focus on him, and he does the rest. And that's what these singers are patiently waiting to sing about. He who
Dear Lord, thank you for sending the mighty Holy Spirit to be here tonight. Thank you for the blessed anointing and help us to remember what we have heard and to be engaged in the good fight of faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.